And with that, I am very excited to um, introduce our uh, plenary speaker keynote here today, uh, which is David Zipper. David is a visiting fellow at Harvard School, uh, the Taubman Center. Uh, he has a whole range of experience uh, working both within City Hall and in a couple of different cities, uh, um, working with venture capitalists, uh, doing policy research, uh, being a startup advocate, just a range of things. And more recently, he's just been a prolific writer on these topics. He's, I'm sure you've seen his articles in City Lab, The Atlantic, Wired, Slate, Car Driver, and Fast Company. And uh, we're very excited to have him here. And I will invite David, if you're there, I'm going to stop sharing and have you take over the reins here. Very good. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, we can do both those things. Sounds like a win. Awesome. Uh, well, thanks, uh, Nico. I appreciate the intro. I appreciate the chance to join everyone. Um, I've always wanted to come to Urbanism Next. And uh, you know, for now, I'll be in Washington, DC, coming to you virtually, but hopefully next year live in, uh, in Oregon. Um, but with that, why don't I now share my screen? And just confirm everybody can see, someone can see that, send a, a note or something. We can see it, looks great. Awesome, I love it. All right, very good, well, let's dive right in then. Um, what, so it, with the time that I have with you here today, I thought I would uh, share with you some thoughts that I've been developing really over the last couple of years about something that I think is, um, is sort of a challenge that we face with cities and with transit agencies in the US, but really abroad as well thinking about new technologies, because uh, we are in a, at a time when so many new technologies are coming around, um, and, and, and how we think about them, how we plug them into our existing transportation networks. And in particular, I find myself coming back to uh, this concept that a lot of us are familiar with really from middle school called FOMO, and how I think it might be leading us astray. So the title of my presentation is Don't Worry About Missing Out, and uh, without further ado, I'm just going to dive right in. Um, and I actually am going to skip really fast over this because Nico was very thoughtful in providing an introduction. Uh, suffice to say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a visiting fellow at the Kennedy School at Harvard. I have a background with both cities and with uh, working with, with startups, which I continue to do from time to time. Um, but really, th these are ideas I'm going to be sharing with you today are those that I've been developing really over the last couple of years as a writer. Um, I'm a contributing writer at City Lab, so if you'll indulge me, I'm going to interweave a few of those articles as we go through the conversation. Uh, but first, let's put transportation aside and just join me on a little bit of a, of a scenario, if you will. Let's pretend that it's Saturday evening. It's like seven o'clock. You're, you're, you're on your sofa at home. You're settling in for a nice, quiet evening to watch your favorite 80s sitcom rerun, because we all have one, right? And just as you're getting comfortable, um, you get a phone call and it's your phone call, Jill. And you pick it, it's your friend, Jill, excuse me. And you say, hey, what's up, Jill? And she says, hey, oh my God, where were you last night? And you say, what, what, what happened last night? And she says, oh my gosh, Sally finally had that party she'd been wanting to throw forever. You didn't get the invite? Oh my God, it was awesome. I saw people I hadn't seen in ages. I've got three dates lined up. I, the drinks, I've never even heard of such things you could do with, me, with, with mezcal, it was amazing. I, why, why weren't you there? And she means well, she's just trying to share some enthusiasm she's just had, but we've all had moments like this. What are you feeling? You probably feel a little insecure, a little bit frustrated, a, a, little, bit, a little bit just thinking like, wait, why wasn't I invited? Why wasn't I there? And you know what? maybe the next time you get a party invite, you might be a little more inclined to take it and to go, even if you aren't really sure you wanna be there. This is all part of the ent entirely normal psychological experience we experience of FOMO, the fear of missing out. We're all humans. We want to be in, like among the, the first to, to get something, we wanna be at the cool place. And we feel a little bad if we see uh, somebody else get something before us. And I'm gonna argue that, uh, that this idea of FOMO is actually pretty deep route rooted in today's conversations around urban mobility technology. Um, just, even, just earlier today, I had a transit official ask me who, she, who I thought her biggest competitors were, referring to other transit agencies. And my response was, well, I think it's people driving. <laughs> but 
but we, but, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about what I mean when I talk about applying FOMO to urban, urban mobility technology. Well, here's just a selection of some of what I see as the, the trendiest technologies at the moment or ones that, that I hear cities and, and transit agencies bringing up to me or, or talking about publicly. You've got AVs, often with shuttles, the Hyperloop, mobility as a service platforms, and then you've got uh, robo taxis. Now, there's others too, but, but you oftentimes will hear cities and transit agencies talk about their enthusiasm for deploying one of, the, of these projects in a pilot format or how they can be among the first to do so. So let's just give a few examples. Huh? This is from Arlington, Texas, uh, from a couple years ago, where a local official was quoted as saying, Milo will go down in history as the very first time that a government, a municipal government, has really offered this service to the general public. Well, think about that. That's great for the government, I guess. You get to say you did it first, but what exactly is the general public getting out of this? It goes unsaid. And by the way, it wasn't, it wasn't mentioned elsewhere in the article either. Or let's, uh, let's move to the West a little bit and look at Colorado, where in uh, 2016, Colorado DOT got a lot of mileage out, no, no pun intended, out, out of uh, hosting and providing support for the world's first autonomous beer run, as they put it, which went between Fort Collins and Colorado Springs. The, uh, the state DOT devoted a number of, of officials to help with this, and they had an escort and so forth and so on, created some nice little articles for about 24 or 48 hours, and then it sort of faded from view. I'm not sure that this had a really much of a longstanding impact on Coloradans' lives. And more recently, some of you might have seen this, in Los Angeles, Mayor Garcetti announced the first in the nation urban air mobility partnership. This is flying taxis. He said, we're gonna get this first and we're gonna do it in Los Angeles. And the response was uh, not ideal, I would say. Uh, this is a quote from Alyssa Walker, a journalist some of you are gonna know and a Los Angelino, saying almost no one seemed to know what this meant, but the immediate reaction that it was probably something bad. <laughs> because when people don't know why they're getting a new technology, they tend to project really not so good things upon it. And then finally, a last example, It's one moment. It's really several. Um, you know, there's a whole variety of, of projects that are kind of related. <laughs> uh, building a tunnel in Miami where to, for, for automobiles, which really can't support tunnels given the geology there. Spending $48 billion on a tunnel that goes less than a mile in Las Vegas. The idea of building another tunnel between O'Hare and, and the Loop in Chicago, which are served pretty well by transit already. Um, these are all ideas that have been supported by local officials, and they all have this guy in common, you might recognize him, but we need not belabor the point. Um, you know, this is what, what FOMO can lead you to lead public officials to do, in my view, to get excited about bringing a new technology to the city because of the headlines that that, that could bring. And it could potentially create some kind of, I guess, of a halo effect over the official that does so. Um, but, I, but it can be at best wasteful and potentially more than that. I mean, I, I recognize that some of the examples I just walked through need not have involved a whole, a whole lot of money or time that was, that, was, that was spent. And it'd be reasonable to say, well, how big of a problem is this really? And I'd argue it's actually can lead to real life and death situations. Uh, th you know, three or four years ago, the governor of Arizona, Doug Ducey, really made a priority of his economic development strategy to bring autonomous vehicles or to autonomous vehicle testing from California, where the regulations were, were quite strict in a number of ways, especially with reporting, to Arizona. And he mounted a big campaign about this. This actually, this image is from an advertisement from the state at the Harvard Business Review. And part of the pitch was about the good weather in Arizona, but part of the pitch was, hey, we'll take care of all regulations. You have free reign to do what you want. You can go back and you can see the, the announcements. I'm paraphrasing, but that's pretty much the, intent, the extent of, of the pitch. And then tragically, literally three years from tomorrow, um, Elaine Hertzberg was, uh, was walking her, her bicycle across the road, many people remember this, and she was struck and killed by a prototype uh, autonomous vehicle from Uber. And almost immediately then, you know, Uber stopped serving Arizona, the, the state clamped down on regulations. Uh, but this I would claim, it, I would argue, is an example of where uh, policy informed by FOMO led to really led, I think, to a woman losing her life. 
And this is the problem with FOMO. It's when you set, when you apply it to policy, you end up with policies that are based on image and not on solving a problem. I went so far as to write about this in declaring FOMO as an enemy of good urban mobility policy in City Lab, which at this point was, I believe, a year and a half ago. Uh, and that begs the question, you know, what's the opposite of FOMO, right? If this if that's not the way to think about the future of your city and the kinds of investments you want to make, whether you're an MPO or you are a DOT or you're a transit agency, well, I'll argue it's established approaches that work. And how are you going to know if they're going to work? Well, you probably want to start with what your goals are as a city rather than starting with the technology that you read about in TechCrunch or, or that you've heard about and seems like it could be it could be trendy. And you know, we have some pretty well-established uh, goals across cities right now that I think are very, very good ones. I know you're gonna be talking about them over the course of the next few days here at Urbanism Next. You know, many cities wanna cut greenhouse gases. They wanna promote equity. There's a desire to, to save lives through vision zero efforts and increasingly vehicle miles traveled had become a, a priority as well. All of these are entirely valid and, and I think appropriate uh, uh, ways to, to base your, your, your technology, your, really all of your, your urban planning and, and technology strategy. So what does that actually mean? Or what does that end up prioritizing once you think about those sorts of goals? Well, I think sidewalks rise to the surface as something that may warrant prioritization. Sidewalks are, are sort of like a, a forgotten piece of urban infrastructure right now. But if you think about it, it can achieve, a better sidewalk network can achieve a bunch of those goals that you that you that we just talked about earlier. Um, there's because in this country, in the United States, we make uh, abutting landholders often pay for sidewalk improvements and maintenance. You end up with cities like New Orleans uh, having the worst networks for sidewalks in low-income communities. That's some research that was done by a woman named Kate Lowe over in Chicago that I think is very powerful. And by the way, how are you going to be able to take the bus or reach that shared mobility service if you don't have a safe place to walk? And for that matter, it, this is a vision zero issue. If you want to be able to get people out of the roadway where they're more likely to be struck, you want to provide them with safe places to walk on the side that are protected from automobiles. Or think about the protected bike lane. Certainly not very expensive to produce. It's just putting some paint down with some dividers but the protected bike lanes have consistently been shown to reduce collisions for cyclists by over 50%. Again, this is something that seems like it's an intervention well aligned with the kinds of goals that I began, uh, began with just a few slides ago. Or let's get a little more tactical, something that really doesn't get a lot of attention, covered bus shelters. Um, you know, there's a guy named Alon Levy who's done some really interesting analysis about this. I, I basically concluded that Creating a covered bus shelter, which protects you from, from the rain or from snow, would cost about $8,500. That ends up being about $550 for each new permanent uh, transit commuter that a transit agency would get in pre-COVID times. I don't see any reason why it would be different in the future. By the way, that's about one-tenth the cost, on average, of getting a new transit rider through building a new, uh, new train station, something you hear a lot more about. This is something that I think is a great example of what I think of as, as mundane mobility. And speaking of transit for that matter, how about bus rapid transit, having dedicated lanes to help bus riders travel faster and encourage people to ride the transit instead of, instead of driving. Um, if you take surveys of transit riders, including surveys specific to low income transit riders, and you ask, would you rather have fair free transit, which by the way is a really topic, it's a very, another sort of FOMO based I think priority right now among transit agencies, or would you prefer to have reliable and fast transit? Overwhelmingly respondents say we prefer reliable and fast transit. This seems like it could be a pretty good, a pretty good response here. And you know, I, I wrote about this saying like, and this was a, a year ago in City Lab saying, maybe we need to think less about FOMO and more about cheap and boring solutions, the mundane mobility solutions that really can maybe not grab the headlines, but actually can have, a, can have a much better chance to help us achieve the goals that really, I think, by and large cities share now around climate, around equity, and around safety. And, you know, I think really the, the closing sort of piece of the argument that I think I wanted to share with you today is that I don't think it's an either or. I don't think that 
a city needs to decide, am I going to really focus on the new technologies or am I going to focus on getting the basics right? Because I'll argue that getting the basics right is a necessary precondition for actually having the technologies work in the sense of having people use them consistently. Let me explain to you a little bit more of what I mean by that. So all of these technologies I, I started with, and there's others we could throw in here too, whether it's AVs or it's, it's flying taxis or it's MOS, it's all based on some version of a future city that looks something like this. Meaning that there's a lot of ways to get around a city that don't involve driving your own car. Everything is sort of based on this idea that you can, you can take transit, you can bike, and that creates sort of like a baseline of support. And then you can also, if you choose, you could take an autonomous vehicle or you could take that, that, that flying taxi once in a while, what have you. Um, and I'm going to argue that the only way to get here is by getting the basics right first. So let's just focus on Moss for a minute. For those who don't know, this is one of the trendiest topics around, I think, for transit agencies these days, sometimes for cities too, um, and where you've got a whole suite of companies that have Moss products, something along these lines. These are all tech companies saying this is the tech solution to get people out of their cars and instead uh, using the sort of collection of other mobility services that are around. Uh, really, for those who may not be familiar, the core elements of Moss, I would argue at least, are multimodal trip planning in one place, usually an app. You can buy a ticket across multiple modes there. And if you wanted to get a, a subscription uh, that could be monthly for a bucket of mobility goods, including customer service to help you if there's some sort of a problem in the handoff, say between transit and ride hail or something like that. And Nico, I know is gonna have thoughts on this because he, he's done uh, some interesting research looking around the world at MOS deployments. Uh, but but here's my, my question, I guess, with MOS is, if you're gonna have the slickest possible app in the world that is gonna have all the, your options right there on your smartphone, it works perfectly, it's affordable, you've got a friendly customer service agent who can assist you if something goes wrong once in a while. Here's my question, how much is that really going to lead you to leave your car at home or maybe not buy one in the first place if this is your experience when you're biking or when you're using a shared scooter because you don't have a safe place to commute. Or if when you use that slick Moss app to buy a transit ticket, you find yourself waiting 45 minutes because that's when the next bus is coming. Is it really gonna be possible to get people out of their cars by using a Moss app if you don't have the basics right with protected lanes and with reliable transit? I don't think so. I mean, this is an article I wrote again with City Lab saying, I don't think there is an app to get people out of their cars. We've got to get the basics right first. And I actually think that applies to, uh, to broader uh, arguments about other sorts of forms of technology as well. It's hard for me to see how we're going to have a, uh, a, a, a future where we're using air taxis and we're going to be uh, not needing to have our own personal vehicle if we can't first have our have sidewalks that, that are wide enough for us to be comfortable in in the cities and neighborhoods where we live. So some parting thoughts. Um, I think that being first with the mobility tech deployment, which I hear all the time, um, is a distracting, potentially dangerous goal. There's not so much of a need maybe to look over our shoulders and say, well, wait, what's our peer city doing? That's a human reaction, but it's FOMO induced and it may not lead to the best options really for improving the lives of residents and cities. And maybe uh, you know mundane mobility solutions like sidewalks, which I keep coming back to because I think sidewalks are great, uh, they can be surprisingly valuable. Maybe we should think a little bit more about them even if we're not hearing as much about them in the media. And if we don't have as many lobbyists perhaps who are suggesting them because frankly, there's no venture capitalist investing in sidewalks that I know of. Uh, and then finally, um, the moonshot mobility tech solutions that we think about, especially the shared ones, they really rely on cities first getting the basics right. And I think that's a good place to start. So if you're interested in the articles that I mentioned, you can see them. I've got a website right there, davidzipper.com. And I invite you to also, you can find me on Twitter if you'd like to give feedback um, and tell me if you disagree, of course. Uh, but I think actually you might have a chance to tell me if you disagree even earlier than that, because now I'm going to stop sharing my... Uh, my screen and Nico and I will be able to chat for a bit with questions from you as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, uh,
great to have the presentation. And I have to say, uh, in a lot of ways, I'm right there with you, right? So uh, uh, Urbanism Next comes out of the Sustainable Cities Institute, which has a long history of working on sustainability. And you know, I have two decades of working in urban design and sustainability. And I still believe that the old urbanism is the new urbanism, right? Compact development, density, mixed use, transit as a backbone, walk, bike infrastructure, all these pieces, absolutely. Um, so absolutely uh, uh, appreciate and share a lot of the skepticism, especially around things like uh, um, the Hyperloop and uh, flying taxis. Um, but I kind of wanted to ask a question, uh, a couple things. One. Does it have to be either or, right? Because there are benefits that can come out of these uh, emerging technologies. Well, there's, there's two sides, right? On the one hand, there are benefits that can be coming out of these emerging technologies. Uh, for instance, older adults, adults getting to hospital visits, Uber has been fantastic for that, right? Like, in the, and, and they're, I think, just scratching the surface for things like that. Um, single or no car households being able to access more areas, absolutely. Uh, and I don't say that in the least bit in disagreement with what you're saying, I'm all for more bike lanes, absolutely. And I'm all for transit being the backbone. But the, the you kind of present it, and I want to clarify here, as an either or, that you can either do like the mundane mobility or the kind of new mobility pieces. I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Well, I, I certainly do think that, that there are technological applications and new services that can help achieve urban goals. But I guess that's kind of just it. I think the, the constructive place to start for cities and for transit agencies is what their goals are. You know, greenhouse gas reduction, um, you know, supporting equity, so, uh, imp uh, reducing crashes. Those are all entirely legitimate so, uh, goals that frankly are the lens through which we should be evaluating both mundane solutions like sidewalks, as well as technological solutions. Like Uber is gonna do some good things potentially, uh, but also do some bad things for goals like reducing congestion or reducing VMT. I actually think when you apply, when you start with those principles though, some technologies like frankly e-scooters look a lot better than they may get credit for in, in the public, but others frankly kind of look terrible. Um, I'm not at all convinced that air taxis achieve much of any of our goals. When you think about the induced trips they're likely to inspire and the potential uh, risks they pose to equity. Uh, and too often, I would argue, we start with technology from the point of, well, how can we use this? As opposed to starting from the point of saying, what are our goals? And, and does technology fit into this? And if so, how do we make sure that we are really leveraging the technology to get the maximum value from it so that we can achieve our goals as, as, as quickly and as, most, as effectively as we can? But 100% agree. Uh, and you know, we say all the time, start with what is it you're trying to get to? What are the outcomes you're trying to get to? What is it you're trying to achieve? And then figure out how you leverage the technologies to do that. And if actually our, our speaker tonight, uh, Liz Ogbu, in, in preparing for her talk, one of the conversations we were having is that tech sometimes uh, feels like a solution in search of a problem, right? And, totally. and they're, they're the, with being approached like that. Um, and a lot, a lot of what you're saying, I see as, as a don't chase the hype, right? Which I 100% with you. Um, don't ch chase the technology, figure out what the goals are, but also ask the questions of how is it that these things can be leveraged, right? What opportunities are there with this? So um, what, what would you say, what would you tell a city? Like you've got limited resources and by resources, I'm not only talking about money, but the amount of time that you have, your attention spans, like what are you gonna, what you wanna communicate with your community about? Um, what would your advice to a city be? Yeah, I think that some cities have been quite good at this. I think of, of, of Boston as with their, their urban, new urban mechanics being pretty public about what their goals are, what, their, what kind of problems they're looking for new ideas to address. Because frankly, you know, I've worked extensively with startups um, and you know, entrepreneurs are not mind readers. They can come up with possible ideas or applications of a solution that they're developing that might help a city in their minds, but it'd be a lot better if they could actually see somewhere what the city of Dallas is, is trying to address or a particular neighborhood that they're looking to address solutions within. Um, Los Angeles has done, a, 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 although I was just sort of criticizing the air taxi stuff there, they actually have done a good job, I think, in, in under Mayor Garcetti in sort of establishing zones where they want to apply new technologies and explaining what they're looking for. 
So I think being upfront and, and, and public about what you're open to, what you're, and, and how you would evaluate an idea that comes through the door is great. And I also think having a channel where like a front door for those kinds of, of ideas to come into makes sense as well. Um, and again, the, there's the one example there on the transit side is, is the Office of Extraordinary Innovation at LA Metro, which from the title you can guess, like they're basically in charge of unsolicited proposals and they actually have a process to, to get through them. Um, so I think those are a few pieces of advice I would give. But so for some of these things, I, I, it makes it really clear for me, right? Flying taxis on, on its face, it seems like it doesn't really answer any of the questions, major problems that we have. And maybe it's just a less expert, expensive helicopter, right? And probably with a similar clientele. But, um, but what criteria should cities, so, so I guess I'm wondering, what about all the things that we're not sure about, right? So scooters, right? right. When they first arrived, right. I mean, was that like, would you would you characterize that in the FOMO camp? And what are all these cities doing all of a sudden dealing with scooters? And I'd, I'd say there's like two questions that I want to ask around that. One of them is, a new technology comes, what criteria do you use to figure out, is this one I should be paying attention to? And what what kinds of things should I be doing? And how do I, how, how much leeway should I give that this isn't going to be perfect when it first arrives, right? And the second part of it is, how do I deal with things that are um, that might have negative impacts, right? Like you can't necessarily say like, oh, okay, well, you know, TNCs don't exist, uh, or, or I'm not going to. That does not seem like the future, so I'm just not going to pay attention to it. And then all of a sudden, you have all these congestion problems, right? So there's two questions. How, how do you how do you deal with the 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 um, how do you know? Well, <laughs> how do you pick winners, and then how or how how can you be willing to test those things? And then how do you deal with the the impacts of the negative impacts? Well, there's a couple points there. I feel like uh, we've talked about FOMO. There's also the fear of missing out. There's also the fear of being stuck. Maybe I should turn out like Bob's. Because uh, I, uh, I, 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 was, I was in the DC mayor's office when ride hail showed up where there was huge fear, terror of being stuck with ride hail. And I think that, um, that that had a lot to do with cities reacting reflexively against e-scooters when they showed up, really not asking for forgiveness, not permission. Um, and in some ways it's kind of funny. Like, I feel like, uh, we need to be more harshly critical of things like really anything Elon Musk is suggesting <laughs> bluntly, uh, while at the same time, you know, some things that maybe cities didn't necessarily trust at first turns out to be like scooters can turn out to be more, more effective and more useful than we thought about 40%, it seems give or take of scooter trips, take the place of automobile trips, which is good if you've got a v VMT reduction as a goal. So to answer your second point about, um, or, or answer the, another part of your question about what to do when you don't know what a technology is going to, get, get impact it's gonna have. Well, I feel like you and I have actually maybe both uh, explored this idea of pilots, dare I suggest. Um, uh, urbanism, and I'll let Nico explain this, but I know you've got a report that came out and I myself wrote a policy brief at, um, for Harvard at the, the Kennedy School and the Taubman Center about how cities can use, leverage pilots or li basically limited deployments to test hypotheses that can either confirm or reject their ideas about how a new technology might help them achieve those goals, which we keep talking about, greenhouse gases or more safety, what have you. I think that's the way to do it. And this may seem obvious, but I can promise you that it is actually the exception, not the rule, when a city is articulate ex ante about what goals they have with a pilot and what they're trying to learn from it, as opposed to just trying to get it out the door and just stand back and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have thoughts on this too, because you've worked on this a lot. Well, yeah, and I'd say that two pieces. One of them, and Becky, uh, Becky Steckler here at Urban, Urbanism Next led the work on, um, on pilots, a report that we put out um, last year, this, this year. Um, and yeah, the, you know, the, the, it seems like that is the way of working, right? Figuring out, trying an idea, testing it, and, and not going in all the way, but also trying to figure things out. And it really leads to a second point, which is something that we were seeing a lot in the work that we're doing. And I mentioned it here uh, earlier in, the, in my presentation, which is this question of the long game. One of the things that's become absolutely clear over this last year, I think it was, if, if you scratch the surface, it was there before, but for us, it's become really clear, is that a lot of these systems are tremendously complex, right? So when you think about, uh, you know, um, the whole MOS system, if you think about some of the um, new mobility modes, if you think about 
uh, definitely autonomous vehicles. And, or, you know, one of the topics that we've been working a lot on is thinking about how you make sure equity happens in all these things. We know we have certain goals we want to get to. Understanding how you translate these technologies into that is by no means clear. So, you know, I'm with you with it. You can't, you, you, there's definitely some things that we should maybe reject on its face, but there's a whole host of things, which I would legitimately say, I'm not sure, right? I'm not, I, I'm not sure. And, um, or, oh, I see a potential there, but to get to that potential is really complicated. And so right. one of the things that we've really, so the whole like approach of the long game, and this is, you know, the work that we're doing with the Knight Foundations, with Cityfy and with cities of Pittsburgh, uh, San Jose, uh, Detroit, and Miami has really been understanding that ah, if you want to think about equitable deployment with these types of technologies, you can't all of a sudden say, well, let's put this technology in this, you know, uh, lower income neighborhood and make it work tomorrow. There is a ton of learning that needs to happen. Everything from the, you know, the operations kind of questions to, you know, issues about uh, um, insurance or liability uh, to, you know, how you make sure that people have uptake, all these types of things. And so as opposed to trying to deploy 100% at first or thinking that you're going to be able to, to um, uh, uh, deploy and have like wonderful outcomes, there's a whole lot of learning that needs to happen. And that pilots are exactly the moment to, to be, the ways to be doing this, these small steps where you pilot and then you pivot. No, it's, it's a really important point. And I think cities, frankly, need to be more deliberate and strategic about how they set up those pilots and often maybe leverage a university to help with the analysis and to really to test the impact because it's not every DOT that has the capacity uh, to be able to do that. Um, but I'll, I'll just further complicate things but because I'll say that, that cities need the space to be able to run those tests. And in the current world in which we live, or at least in the United States, a real challenge to be able to do that is preemption. Like you talked about Pittsburgh, uh, here's another technology I've not talked about or we haven't talked about so far, sidewalk robots. Well, Pittsburgh was doing a great job of creating a, 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 a pilot program that they could learn from with sidewalk robots with limited deployment. And then thanks to some corporate lobbying, the state of Pennsylvania passed a rule preempting Pittsburgh and every city in the state, except maybe Philadelphia, it's debatable. Uh, to basically say now all sidewalk robots are officially pedestrians. Anything up to 550 pounds moving, uh, moving, I believe 12 or 15, I can't remember, 12 or 15 miles an hour, but really fast, 550 pounds empty, by the way, uh, they're now pedestrians. And, and Pittsburgh was livid. And I think they have every right to be livid because you can't learn if you, if you aren't given space to do so. And um, for those of us who care about cities getting better with new technology, I think we need to make clear we, we need to keep states out of urban mobility policy un, until we know whether and how to deploy these technologies. Yeah, so actually, we've been working with Pittsburgh on some of these topics. Yes, <laughs> it's really challenging. It's when this, when, when this, and, and the biggest issue is when states open the floodgates, right? Allow a lot of things without any kinds of uh, controls or... or um, yeah, ability to control the thing. I, I gave the example to someone or the analogy shortly with that exact very, very topic with Pittsburgh and, and uh, Pennsylvania is that it's like getting your, your five-year-old and teaching them how to ride a bike. And like, after they've been on it for like, you know, five or 10 minutes being like, great, here's a motorcycle <laughs> and putting them on top of that. And you're like, maybe we should take a, some baby steps and do a lot of learning here before we open the floodgates here and, you know, have, have a potentially much more difficult and, and complicated pieces. And yeah, right. so one of the questions as well, which I think is inherent in all of this, and it's a, in the session we had this morning on, on Dancing with Disruptions, and there's a couple other sessions that are going to be dealing with this, like kind of the nimbleness in government. One of the issues that really comes up is risks. So these new technologies are coming, uh, or I should say, they're, they're at our doorsteps, right? Like, should, should, they be, should they be like widespread? I don't know. Uh, um, they're at our doorsteps. Testing them, figuring out like what, what works and what might be possible has inherent risks. What advice would you give to cities in, in dealing with this, right? How do, how, do you, how do you measure these risks and how do you, um, how do you decide what kinds of risks are, are worth taking? Uh, like give an example of what kind of risk you're referring to. Well, I'm, I'm thinking uh, of things like um, we're going to try, for instance, the, you know, the, the one that we've all lived through is you know, scooters, e-scooters arrived, right? For a lot of cities like taking that on, there's a ton of risk of what that thing is going to turn into and how it's going to work out. And um, you know, many people are like just 
don't want to deal with that, right? Or like, you know, cities are generally risk averse entities. Uh, and yet all this transition, not knowing what tomorrow is going to be like, all the shifts that are happening, inherently there has to be more risk. You have to be able to take on more risk, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, this gets back, frankly, to, you know, going small before you go big. So if you, if, if, if you get, it's not a screw up if you run a pilot and you learn like, okay, there's actually bad stuff that comes from this deployment. And frankly, you can either correct it or you just say this technology doesn't have a role here. And Frank, one of the suggestions that came out of that policy brief that I wrote with Harvard was to say, be articulate up front about what you're trying to learn so that if you do ultimately conclude, look, this technology doesn't do anything that helps our city or what we hoped it would do, you can basically pull the plug and explain why. And in my experience, you know, the media should respect that and, and go forward. But I do want to challenge one uh, maybe assumption that I, I'm not sure if, if you were saying this so much, but I do hear it. Um, you know, there was a LA uh, official when the urban air mobility uh, uh, sort of like first in the nation center was was unveiled. Uh, some of the, this official said, look, these technologies are coming and we just have to get ready for them. And, you know, well, not necessarily. I think that's actually a little too fatalistic because there are examples of technologies that cities and society just rejected. We, there were urban steam engines in the 19th century had a bad habit of exploding and killing people. And when they weren't exploding and killing people, they created horrible pollution in central cities and they got banned in the late 19th century. We've done it before. And if we could do that if we wanted to with drones uh, or with um, with with you know with, with flying taxis. So I, I I want to sort of like maybe give a pep talk to urban officials sometimes and say, you know, like it's okay if if we are going to reach a thoughtful conclusion that this technology has no application here. Yeah, and I, I would say <laughs> this requires. I mean, the difficulty is if cities say, ah, oh, I'm kind of interested in this. Well, well, let's see. We don't have to say that it's like at our doorstep, and then the state preempts. Right. I mean, like, that makes it really hard because then it is at your doorstep. And I think it's incumbent on cities to be informed, right, trying to figure out, does it work and does it not? So, you know, testing things out, taking baby, baby steps, communicating like crazy. And I sharing to, results, right? Yeah, That's and sharing results. Do. Yeah. That's yeah. one thing that I, I feel like doesn't happen as much is like a city runs a great uh, pilot. And then, I mean, groups like NACTO and frankly, universities like, like yours can help with that. But I think we could do much better to share what we've learned and make sure that cities don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, I, I want to get to some of the questions that we're getting from uh, people uh, in the in the Q&A. And there's a couple of different questions that ask about um, uh, uh, venture capitalist funding, right? So so uh, one person is asking, uh, how do you bring venture capital to, to the mundane? Uh, and the other one is, you know, before VC funded and arrived, cities themselves stopped, interest, stopped uh, investing in sidewalks, right? So that's, on the one hand, Yes, we should be doing sidewalks and you know uh, bike lanes and, and things like that. There doesn't seem to be the the uh, economic push to make those things. There's not the political will, which is probably part of the truth, or, or the economic push to do that. Are there ways to leverage uh, um, these things, the 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 energy that does exist, to point it towards these things? What do you think? Well, um, I'd say first of all, uh, you know, the reality is. Um, yeah, I'm a former city official myself. <laughs> uh, I heard a lot about, I heard a lot of electrification of automobiles from companies approaching me. I heard some about autonomous vehicles, even, you know, back eight years ago when I was in city hall in Washington, DC, I didn't hear anybody pushing sidewalks. There's just not money to be made in that way. And I think like, I appreciate the, the sentiment if, if someone was suggesting, how can we get venture capital behind sidewalks? But um, I worry that that, that might, <laughs> might be tilting at windmills a little bit. I mean, in an ideal world, you know, Amazon and FedEx, among others, would, would, would instead of trying to lobby state officials in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, to treat sidewalk robots as pedestrians, they'd be saying, hey, let's have more sidewalks. <laughs> uh, or let's have bike lanes wide enough that our robots can accommodate them. It's just not really the way the world works in that sense. So... You know, it's true to say that, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, sidewalks and bike lanes weren't the priority then either, but, you know, priorities can shift. And I'm old enough, you're old enough, Nico, to know how much bike infrastructure 
uh, conversations have just completely changed. And, you know, bike share has been, is, is really like, as one person said, like the innovation of the, of the, the, of the last decade. Um, and frankly, you know, priorities like climate change and vision zero are, I think, much more deeply felt among cities now than they were 20, 30 years ago. And my, my, what I try to do with my writing is to highlight, like I've written about sidewalks before and, I, and I've written about bike lanes. I try to highlight the sorts of solutions that don't have the, the money, the venture capital, the, the just capital writ large behind them, but they really can help. And I frankly think if you're coming to a conference like Urbanism Next, I know there's a lot of students here. Uh, there's a lot of people who are urban planners who are helping, and there are a lot of public officials. Um, you know, it's, it's, I know how busy life can be, but the challenge for all of us, I think, is to look beyond the messages that are sort of paid end up in, in our inboxes, metaphorically speaking. Like I literally have PR pitches that are sent to my inbox and it's not for sidewalks, I can promise you that. Um, but I think it's on all of us to look beyond that and really try to figure out what do we most need to achieve the goals that have evolved in the last 10 or 20 years. And I think that, that many of us, probably everybody on this, this, this call probably share. Yeah, so I, I, like, like I said, I don't think you will find any, I don't think there's a whole lot of, in, in the, the group that comes to um, this conference, I don't think you're gonna find a lot of people who are disagreeing with that. But one of the questions I have still is like, how is it, I mean, cause I, you, you made a really good point, I think earlier of this new mobility, you know, mass, all this type of world needs mundane mobility, right? So how do we leverage that message to get funding to mundane mobility. I mean, you know, a really good example, I love the work that the scooter companies have done to try to get more bike infrastructure in cities, right? We'll call it, we'll call it micro mobility infrastructure, right? Um, what are, what, how do you see that happening? Is it happening? Do you, do you uh, uh, how do we get more of it? Um, I guess, you know, I, I think of, I'm gonna push back actually. I, I worry if the way that we're gonna get bike lanes is uh, from micromobility companies investing in that because their priorities can change. If you, some of you might, who follow the, that field closely might know that Bird for a few months there got a lot of great publicity back like three years ago and they said they'll donate, I think it was a dollar a scooter a day. I forget the exact way it was toward bike lanes in given cities, like the support infrastructure that was protected. Sounded great got some great publicity. And then within a few months, it just sort of faded away. It faded away. But, but I'd put, push back against that, which is, I think the publicity might have actually been better than the dollars, right? Because if we can start to, if we use some of these things to get people to pay attention to, oh, there's these other bits of infrastructure, right? These other pieces of infrastructure that are really important, that might actually be as worthwhile in the long term, because then we can actually get, you know, uh, a bond measure pass. I mean, changing the public sentiment, like this whole idea that you said before of like, you know, changing priorities, this helps make evidence some of these change priorities. I don't know, maybe Nico, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that, that our future should be placed with the lobbying efforts of quote unquote, the good shared mobility companies. What I'd rather see, what I get more pleased by is like when I see I'll give you a, a mundane example on the on the organizing side. People are probably familiar with ghost bikes, which are the the painted white bikes that are placed in, as memorials where someone was struck and killed by an automobile driver. Um, I find you see this all across the country. I find those to be deeply powerful and actually a real way to organize and say there's something public about these losses. There's something public about our lack of safe infrastructure that I think translates into political pressure and awareness too on officials to create safe spaces. I, I put more confidence on citizens, frankly, to organize. I'd rather see citizens organize to uh, support sidewalks, to support reclaiming space from automobiles, to support bike lanes, than to assume that we're gonna really need corporate corporations behind it. Now, sometimes we do get good contributions like Uber to its credit, put real money behind congestion pricing in New York. Um, and I know Uber is involved in, in, in the conference today, but, and that's great, but I don't think they should be driving the conversation. And I don't think they should be necessary for us to get the change we need. I, I would agree with that, but I would go back to like this either, or like maybe it doesn't need to be either or, but both and, 
right? That we can leverage these things, right? In the end, if what we want is really good bike infrastructure and access, what we really want is access and bike infrastructure we see as a way of doing that, why not, you know, harness where we can the new mobility modes, right? And, and you know, MOS, wherever it exists, right? To help make these things as opposed to saying, wow, well, that's, that's, that should not be the leader. That's fine. But shouldn't we be harnessing these things and, and leveraging where we can? Well, the, the challenge is that some every one of these new modes might, well, not we shouldn't say all of them. Many of them are going to have something good. Like they'll be pushing with something good, like Uber with decongestion pricing in New York. Credit to Uber for that. Legitimate credit there. Uh, but they're also going to be pushing for stuff that's in their, their corporate interest that's terrible for cities. Like Uber trying to, they've successfully preempted uh, cities in what, 47 or of 46 of the 50 states. So that if you are a city official in Los Angeles or in Denver or in Austin, you can't even get data to know how what, what congestion Ride Hill is generating. That's terrible. Like I just like so you've got to be, have clear eyes, I think, to understand what's good and what's bad about what these companies are advocating for. I 100% agree, and I think that I I think what's really needed also is a whole lot of um uh frank conversations about it, right? And and you know. The, uh, understanding what the good is uh, and also understanding what the bad is and not throwing things out because there's bad and not completely adopting them because they're good, but really trying to create forums where, you know, and I think Urbanism Next is really trying to do this, trying to tease apart, you know, understanding the issue, understanding the, the, the mode or the, the new technology and figuring out what are the things we want to help and highlight and like absolutely leverage and, you know, uh, put on pedestals and what are the parts that maybe not so much. And I think that 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 is something that is absolutely needed. Uh, one last question I want to ask is, you know, kind of in this whole realm, when we think about mobility as a service, it's really different the conversations you see in Europe and the conversations you see in the U.S. Yeah, that's in, right. In in Europe, the mobility as a service is a hundred percent seen as like this is how we're going to make transit expand its reach, right? It is like really a look beyond behind uh, uh, transit agencies, or I should say, in support of transit agencies. Um, the the and it's a really different world because transit agencies in Europe, for the most part, are private entities that are having you know five to eight year contracts. In the U.S., you know, we talk about MAS, and it seems like we are mostly focused on TNCs and scooters, right? And transit like has this like lesser role. So. In a, a version of uh, the reason I bring it up is like if we think about the version in Europe where you're really thinking, or you know, we can import that idea here, where um, we're really trying to get to um, for transit to be the backbone, to be the thing that we're supporting, right? What, how, it makes sense then, I would say, to think about these different modes, these new emerging technologies, to figure out how you can leverage those things to help that, right? As opposed to saying, well, this thing doesn't exist, or it's not all that all that effective. I mean, would you would you agree with that 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 maybe if we take that approach where um, you're really trying to think about how to uh, think of something like mass as helping transit as opposed to you know oh well it's this thing that just doesn't work right maybe it's one more thing that can be helping I, I put it in the example similar to you know bike lanes right the, the as I was saying before like there's an ability to leverage these technologies to help some of the things we really want to have happen. Oh boy, it, that's a complicated one. <laughs> um, but uh, I would say that there's certainly, we can see already that public bike share systems are often used to fill that quote unquote first mile, last mile problem of bringing people to and from transit systems or, or transit stations, I should say. Um, and that right there is evidence that there's complementarity or can be complementarity between modes. Now it gets really uh, uh, hairy quickly when you start saying, okay, well then transit should just open up to, to, to all kinds of MOS um, where basically that relationship, which is so valuable with the commuter, with the customer is held by another entity because um, transit agencies, first of all, they're moving the majority of people like, like shared mobility is a tiny, tiny fraction of the people that public transit's gonna move in almost any major city. Uh, but also there's power in maintaining that personal relationship with the consumer of getting information about how they're traveling, about being able to, to communicate with them and take surveys even and things like that. And so you end up with some friction points in Europe uh, where transit agencies have sort of dragged their heels on Moss frequently. And you've had some instances where like in Berlin, 
um, uh, the trans agency BVG created its own uh, Moss app called Yelby because they wanted to be the one in charge. Um, I, I will say this, I, as interesting as I think Moss is, uh, part of the reason why I like to focus on the mundane mobility before I think about Moss technologies is that even in Europe, which has, as you well know, because you lived in Europe for a while, um, you know, Europe has the, the urban form that invites lots of people who are middle class or even wealthy to be able to not need to drive. I've not seen evidence of any Moss app, whether it's Yelby in Berlin or it's Moss Global Whim in Helsinki or the various apps in Antwerp, which are all pretty well known in Europe. None of them that I can see have really driven mode shift. None of them. <laughs> so until, the, until that happens, I'm going to be um, a sort of like supportive skeptic of the of Moss because I want to see it work because I support the goals of reducing the, our, the role of automobiles in cities. But let's not kid ourselves; we don't have evidence that that's that's happened yet mm -hmm. anywhere and in Europe, let alone in America. That that's part of a whole other conversation, which I, I would love to get into because I, I think this is exactly kind of the question of like how do you test things, right? And and at what point do you say this is worthwhile or not? And it's, I think with Moss, we're still very much, we just did a report uh, with uh, TNO, a Dutch think tank, um, and we are very early in deployment. I mean, like around the globe, like the, there's a lot more hype than actual uh, substance in many of these things. Yeah, so have David- Have you seen shift though? I have to ask you, have you seen it? Um, I think in Austria is the place that I've seen the closest. Uh, I don't know where it's at right now, and, and everything's kind of up in the air with, uh, with COVID, but, uh, and it's when transit agencies are the ones who are running it, I think, or, or are really like an integral piece of it that it makes a really big difference. But thank you so much for uh, coming in. I love the presentation. I love the conversation. And I love, we're really excited to have you come in because, you know, the things you're saying, I think really resonate with our beliefs. And I think a, a lot of the people who come to the conference, which is this, the work we do at Urbanism Next is not about technology, right? It's about the outcomes that we want, which are community focused, which are equitable, sustainable, uh, um, these types of things, and that we need to leverage these technologies to get there. And I love that you, the starting off, the kicking off the whole thing with your presentation, because I think it really helps us uh, uh, focus on that. So thank you tremendously. Um, mm -hmm. So in closing today, I just want to um, thank everyone for for coming uh, tonight at um, uh, five o'clock. Liz Ogbu is going to be speaking. Uh, from Studio O. She's a designer, urbanist, spatial justice activist, uh, fantastic speaker, doing, doing really interesting work both in and with communities, and is really figuring out how you link public spaces and healing. I think it's a really great topic for people to be looking at. You, you can link to that uh, talk through the web portal, or sorry, yeah, through our Urbanism Next conference web portal or through the email I think that you've been given. And uh, we will look forward to uh, your conversations there. And don't forget tomorrow morning, eight o'clock, coffee chats. We hope to see you there so that we can have some informal conversations about all these things, continue a lot of the banter that uh, David and I are having here. Hopefully uh, we can see that tomorrow morning. Thank you all. Thanks, David. And we'll see you all uh, with Liz tonight and then tomorrow morning.